Hello, welcome to One on One. I'm your host, Greg Walker. We have a very interesting guest today, folks. I know I say that a lot. I also say anyone I know me to talk with is a potential guest. But ever so often, we get someone in the house that I think has a powerful message, and this lady is just that. She has a powerful message. She's a unique person. Her story, <laughs> just wait till you hear it. From her early days to now, to what she does. She works at Train as a material planner, but she's also the founder and executive director of Fuel. We'll find out about Fuel today. She's the Red River District Coordinator of Lay Speakers for the United Methodist Church. Our guest is Denise Skidmore. I think you're going to enjoy getting to get to know her better. Settle back, relax, enjoy a fun, down-to-earth conversation with a nice woman. Denise Skidmore joins us today right after these words. New Sentra, 14,103. 15 grand off a new Titan. Great selection, great savings. You're gonna love our prices. You're gonna love our prices. Matthews Nissan. The Leaf Chronicle is now available on every device you carry or don't carry. All things Clarksville, in all media, 24 seven. Subscribe now for full access. For a hundred years, Neil Tarpley Parchment Funeral Home has offered ways to live well and plan ahead. A legacy that can make all the difference to your family. Neil Tarpey Parchman, people who care, a name you can trust. It's the great savings event. Save like never before at Clarksville's favorite new car dealer. 8,440 off a new 2017 Altima. 6,431 off a new Rogue. You're gonna love our prices. Welcome to the show today. Our guest, Denise Skidmore. It is a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you are you are going to be an excellent guest. What a powerful person. I, I, I'm really, you know, Brett Parchman was telling me about you. And that's the reason that I got in touch with you and we got Denise on here. And I want you to know, folks, I don't say this often, but I want all of you, especially the regulars and if you're newcomers, I want you to listen because we're going to do two shows. We have to uh, with this woman. I don't say it. This is a, a, a heck of a story. Denise, uh, I, I gave on the intro, of course, the founder and executive director of Fuel. You are a Red River District Coordinator of Lay Speakers, and that's easy to understand why for the United Methodist Church. But I want the folks first to get to know your background a little bit, uh, because I think that even makes her message about fuel, which we will be talking a lot about uh, over the next two shows. But you didn't come from what I would call a family that was silver spoon fed and you got your way with everything you wanted, did you? No, you know, I wasn't raised like most people. Of course, we're all raised a little bit different, you know. You're an Omaha, Nebraska guy. Right, I'm an Omaha, Nebraska Corn girl. Cornhusker. That's right. Go Big Red. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yep, um, I don't follow any pro football at all, strictly oh, well. college, you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but I was raised in Omaha, Nebraska, yeah. family of seven children. I am the youngest girl, and I have a brother that's younger than me, two brothers older, three sisters older. Um, we were raised with parents who did not go to high school. They were um, undereducated is what they'd be called now. Um, I was raised in a house one step above dirt poor. Do you know what that means? Absolutely, okay. I know. So dirt poor is when you have dirt floors in your house. One step above that is when you have wood floors, but you can still see the dirt down underneath it. Bless your heart. So that's the kind of house I was raised in. Now, this wasn't in the 30s. This was 1960 I was born. 
Um, great home, great family. I mean, we, we, we had everything we needed. We didn't have much that we wanted, but we had everything that we needed. Um, two bedroom house, seven kids. So it was, yeah. it was a bit tight, but uh, we did okay. Um, we didn't go to church. We were sent to church. My mom and dad gave us a quarter and said, go to church. And there was a really cool candy store along the way, Alex's. <laughs> We'd stop at Alex's and get some candy and hang in the churchyard wait for church to start and we could hear the music and everything and then when everybody left the church we'd go to the house mom say did you go to church sure we went to church we just never went inside right. we never went inside but you went I, you didn't lie. yeah i didn't lie well and you know i i couldn't figure out what y'all were doing in there you know i saw people getting ready they'd wash their cars they'd put on their best clothes and back in those days everybody hung their clothes outside so you knew when sunday was coming because their sunday best was washed and ironed, you could see it hanging out on the line before they ironed and it. And back in those days, everybody did wear ties. You went to church, you dressed. You wore your Sunday best. Not yeah. necessarily today, but back then, you did. Yep, everybody wore their Sunday best. But I couldn't figure out why you did that. See, the mm. God that I had learned about was this. You're going to hear about that. When you die, you're going to see God. And you're going to answer for everything you did. Somehow we never got to the New Testament. So with that in mind, I thought I was already condemned to hell. Because surely I had already sinned. You know? Yeah, because every time you did something wrong, they told you you were going to hell. Yeah, you're, you're going to answer for that. Yeah. Just understand that you're going to answer for that. Right. It wasn't enough to answer to your teachers and answer to your parents. You were going to answer to God for that. But because I never went inside of a church, we never got to the New Testament. I never got to know about faith and hope and love and forgiveness. Those things were just not a part of our lives. We right. were not raised up in an encouraging environment. So um, with all of that in mind, oh, and by the way, we were that family, the one that didn't get invited to church. You know, that family. Yeah. And as we aged, by the time I was seven, my oldest brother had already committed a murder. He was 14, you were telling me. Mm -hmm. And going to jail for murder. It's not a proud thing, it's not something that people talk about, but I just want you to know that that's what happens when you're raised in a family when there's no hope, yeah. when there's no faith, when there's no reason to do the right thing. See, when there's no reason to do the right thing because you think you're going to hell, you've already condemned yourself and everybody around you has condemned you, then what would be the reason to do the right thing? So we began to go astray, each one of us in our own way. And my brothers got involved with some motorcycle gangs and just, I became, I became a pawn in the game, if you will. And you know, a young woman at that time, pretty. Seven, weren't you seven years old? I was seven years old when they joined, but by the time I was 12, Right. I was already involved with all of that mess. And by the time I was 14, I was sitting in bars and drinking. Your parents just drugs. let y'all go. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Had no parental control well, or yeah, guidance. I, I don't want to say that. I had great parents, but I don't think they knew what to do with us by that time. You know? They'd given up? I don't know if they'd given up. I think they gave in. They gave in. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom struggled to hold the family together. She, you know, she started, she didn't really go to work until I was 12 years old. But when she went to work, she didn't really make a lot of money. And it was kind of a place for her to get out of the house. Right. You know, she, it, it was almost as if they were just surviving this thing that they had created. They were just surviving the family. They weren't really parenting us. Um, so you're in bars at 12. 14, 14 years old, I was sitting in bars. Sitting in bars. Mm -hmm. Sitting in bars, drinking, doing drugs. By the time I was 16, I was already in rehab for the first time. By the time I was in 19, by the time I was 19, I was in rehab for the second time. And somewhere between, between 19 and 21, I realized that if I didn't get out of that lifestyle, I was going to implode. I was doing... And this is not bragging, but I'm going to, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand who I am, how I got where I am, and why I am so thankful for God in my life and everything that he's done. I want you to understand how the fuel program was birthed, where it came from. So 
between 19 and 21, I knew that if I didn't stop, I was going to self-implode. Right. I was staying awake, and this is what happens when you're on methamphetamines. You stay on wa awake for three, four, five days straight, and then you begin to take opioids to sleep. Mm -hmm. That's what's causing the huge opioid problem that we're having is so many people are hooked on methamphetamines, and then they need these to go to sleep at night. So you have this really great high in the daytime, but it goes for days and days and days. And then when you want to sleep, you have to have something to help you sleep to come down. And it starts this vicious cycle. And I was going nowhere. My life was a dead end. And a friend of mine got in touch with me, I had the opportunity to move to Dallas, Texas. It was the right time. Um, there were a lot of things going on in my life at the time that were not good. And I moved to Dallas, Texas. Um, Just on a whim? Yeah, pretty much. I had $20 in my pocket. Really? To Dallas, Texas, yeah. And the drug abuse stopped almost immediately. But I didn't stop drinking. The drinking got worse. Um, I, I mean, I can romanticize about it, but it wasn't a good thing to be doing. Right. And it came down to... Um, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And when you have a lot of free time and you don't have any direction, it can really go bad. So I continued to drink heavily and, and life just wasn't, wasn't changing for me, although I had moved away. A couple of times I had a gentleman who lived upstairs from me in an apartment complex and he invited me to church. And I went a couple of times, but I would go in there and cry and cry and cry because I couldn't understand how I could be forgiven. I mean, I had already been condemned to hell. Right. And <clears throat> time went on, and um, because God has a way of wooing you and taking control of your life when you don't have control of it, I had a really bad car accident. I was in Omaha visiting my parents for Thanksgiving and had a really, really bad car accident. And the doctor said, you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. I had a broken arm and a broken leg and 160 stitches in my face. And I had gone home and gotten right back into, I had gone home for Thanksgiving, and at the time of the car accident, I had been awake for four days. Same thing, same pattern. It didn't change. Every time I went back there, I did the same things I did before. So I had a car accident. I wasn't able to take care of myself, staying with my parents, and um, I met a man. Um, he was drinking just like I was. And he, was, he had just joined the Army. He was getting ready to go into the military. I was 27. People were asking me why I wasn't married. Are you, what, what, what's going on with you? What's wrong with you? Why aren't you married? My brothers and sisters were all married by the time they were 19. Why weren't you married? There's something wrong with you. My dad was really starting to panic that I was never going to get married. So I married this, this man. And uh, we moved away to Europe within just a short while. And he was abusive alcoholic, beat me on a regular basis, threw me out of moving vehicles. I mean, it was horrific, a horrific life. But out of that marriage came two amazing children. And we landed here in Clarksville, Tennessee in 1992. From Fort Campbell. From Fort Campbell, right. And uh, I knew when we came here that I was going to get a divorce. 19 what, 92? 1992. Mm -hmm. And I knew at that time that I was going to get a divorce. All right. You're getting a divorce, 1992, you came to Clarksville. Denise Skidmore, her story, how fuel really came about and what it's about, much more after this. Leaf Chronicle is now available on every device you carry or don't carry.
All things Clarksville in all media, 24-7. Subscribe now for full access. New Sentra, 14,103. 15 grand off a new Titan. Great selection, great savings. You're gonna love our prices. You're gonna love our prices. Our guest is Denise Skidmore. She is the founder and executive director of Fuel. What is Fuel? We're going to find out. She's going to be with us two shows. Right now, if you just tuned in, we're hearing her story, how this all came about. Rough childhood, all the way she got married at 27, abusive, had two wonderful children out of the marriage. They came to Fort Campbell here in 1992. Correct. And, it, you know, I had no place to plug in here. I didn't know anyone here at all. But I knew that I needed to get out of my marriage. Right. Uh, again, I was at a place where I'm not going to survive this. Yeah. Um, so I needed to make some decisions. Well, How long had you been married? I had been married six years. Six years. And I thought to myself, you know, it's not fair to take the children away from their father. Just because he's not a good father, I mean a good husband, doesn't mean I have the right to remove his children from his life. Mm -hmm. He had never been abusive to the children. So I decided to stay here in Clarksville again. I walk out of the marriage with $300 in my pocket, no job. But I knew I needed to get out. I wasn't going to survive. Right. Something really bad was going to happen if I didn't get out of this marriage. What'd you do? So I moved out. I contacted my husband's unit and said, he's yours now. You're going to have to take care of him. And I moved off post. We were living on post at the time. And I began looking for a job. And because God is so good and he knew where I needed to be. And he had brought me this whole way. Been with me and beside me, even though I didn't recognize yeah. him. He opened a door for me with Bridgestone. Bridgestone was building their facility in Clarksville at that time. Ground floor, their office was in the bank building. The building, the building out in the industrial park wasn't even built yet, and they needed a buyer. So I took a job as a buyer with Bridgestone, and I helped them build their facility. You had to be special to get that job. Yeah. I mean, how did you get that job with your background? That's pretty unique in itself. It's a blessing. I say it is a blessing. It was an intervention. So I took the job with Bridgestone, and um, I worked there for 17 and a half years. And during that time, uh, I met an amazing man. He was raised in East Tennessee, Kingston, Tennessee, to be exact. He was a police officer here in Clarksville, still is. And uh, his family was a family is a family of Christians. He was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. Now, when I say raised in the Southern Baptist Church, I mean raised in the Southern Baptist <laughs> Church. His mother just celebrated 40 years of playing the organ at the same church. Mercy. Okay. He was raised up under the pews. He'll tell you some of the things he found while he <laughs> roamed around. He was raised in the Southern Baptist right. Church. And myself, not having been raised in a church, uh, when he told his mother he was going to marry me, she said, I really wanted something more than that for you. <laughs> well, it broke my heart. I couldn't figure out what that meant. What, what more could you want for your husband? I, I mean, for your son. I could drink more tequila than any man she knew. I could stay awake <laughs> longer than anybody she knew. I had this vision of who I was, and she had a vision of what she wanted. Sure. She wanted a well, Christian woman. You were a woman. divorced woman with two kids. That's what you were. She wasn't real excited about it. No. And it broke my heart. But she and her mother, my husband's grandmother, Keefel Henry, amazing woman, began to pray for me. Probably the first people that ever dedicated time to praying for me. They began praying that my life would change. And they, I don't think they even knew what an impact they were going to have on my life, what an impact he was going to have on my life and the lives of my children. So we had to go to marriage classes at the Southern Baptist Church. And this is my first real interaction with a pastor, one-on-one. -on -one. And I had an opportunity to ask him some questions like, can I be forgiven? Is it possible for someone like me, a sinner, to be forgiven? 
And he talked to me for a good long time during these marriage counseling sessions. And it was not all about marriage. It was really a lot about me as an individual. And who do you want to be? What kind of a mother and a wife do you want to be? And what changes are you willing to make in your life? We got married in the Southern Baptist Church, and after we left the wedding and after our honeymoon, I said, we need to find a church to go to. We need to find some place to settle in. And we visited a lot of different churches in Clarksville, amazing churches, wonderful churches. But you know when you reach your church home, yeah. you, get, you have it's that, that feeling. feeling. Yeah. And so I was at church one day. I mean, I was at work one day, and there was a gentleman there. We had maybe spoken 10 times during the 10 years we had worked together. But he heard me say, all I want for Mother's Day is to find a church for my family to go to. Well, he stopped in his tracks, walked back and looked at me, and he said, you should try my church. I said, well, where do you go to church? And he said, we go to Hildale United Methodist Church. And I said, so what do you guys believe in? I had never been in a Methodist church, but I had heard about some of the religions of the South. And so I said to him, tell me in advance, do you do any snake handling? <laughs> well, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Laying on. No. Of hand. Now it's funny to me, but yeah. back then, I mean, <laughs> okay. I want to know you what I'm getting know. my kids into, you know? Right. And he said, no, we just believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. I said, all right, we'll try it. So I went back to my <laughs> husband and I said, I know, it's yeah. funny now. I said to my husband, what do you think? You want to try Hilldale United Methodist Church? Let's, let's, you know, go look. He said, well, you know, we used to attend a Methodist church when we'd go to uh, Myrtle Beach on vacation. We attended a Methodist church, so let's try it. And we walked in there, and I knew immediately. And when we walked out, I said to the kids, what do you think? They said, well, I think it'd be good. I, I like it. I said, good. We found it. Let's right. try it. So the next Wednesday, we went to dinner. It was kind of like a social time. Let's get to know who goes there. Recognized a few faces. Knew some people that went to church there, didn't know that's where they went. And uh, the following Sunday, I went downstairs to take my kids to Sunday school. And this woman rushes up to me and she goes, do you want to teach Sunday school? <laughs> I said, I don't think you realize that I, and before I could get out, I had never opened a Bible. This woman said, if you don't teach Sunday school, we won't have any second and third grade Sunday school teacher. We really need a Sunday school teacher. I, I just, I don't think I'm your girl. And she said, we give you the book. We give you the same Bible the kids have. It, if, it, would you do it? Sure, I'll do it. Give it a try. So through the eyes of the children, I learned about God and Jesus and Moses and Noah and Sarah and Mary and all of the stories of the Bible came to life like you're supposed to learn, you know, through the eyes of a child. Right. I learned about all the stories of the Bible, but most importantly, I learned about forgiveness. Right. And what it, what it, what it meant to me, what an offering it was. So I taught Sunday school for three years to children, and then I took a year off trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I realized that I needed to go into an adult Sunday school class. Well, I had made friends with a woman by that time, uh, Miss Terry Martin, and uh, she said, "What do you have you ever read the book, The Purpose Driven Life? I said, no, I haven't. She said, man, that's an interesting book. You ought to read it. So I read The Purpose Driven Life, and then we got to talk, and we decided we'd open a Sunday school class, an adult Sunday school cl class based on The Purpose Driven Life. And during the course of that class, I was offered the opportunity to go on the walk to Emmaus. Are you familiar with the walk to Emmaus? I'm not. Okay. It's a three day, you can tell that physically I can't walk for three days. <laughs> it's, a, it's a spiritual walk that takes place for three days. We're at the walk and we've only got a couple of minutes. We've got to take a break. We'll be back. Stretch run, show one. She'll be here for show two right after this. It's the great savings event. Save like never before at Clarksville's favorite new car dealer. 8,440 off a new 2017 Altima. 6,431 off a new Rogue. You're gonna love our prices.
For a hundred years, Neil Tarpley Parchman Funeral Home has celebrated legacies with services as unique as each life. Neil Tarpley Parchman, people who care, a name you can trust. Stretch run. We've only got two and a half minutes. Denise Skidmore will be back next week. We're at the walk to a mass. They do this in Nashville, of course, and this started basically fueled. Give right. us, tell us. So the walk to a mass is a weekend filled with testimony. And um, I had never had a one-on-one -on -one with Christ before, but I had some time alone with him. And after the weekend ended, I realized that Christ was counting on me to do something. And I walked away from it knowing that there was going to be something opening for me. And within a few short weeks, I read on the internet about children whose only food source may be the food that they're getting at school. And that just broke my heart. Children whose only food source may be the food that they get at school. And there in that moment. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? Yeah, children go up for, go, go That's for all the only food to get. Yeah. What they get at school. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand or believe that. Oh, it's real. Yeah, it's real. I, I've had one testimony after another that it's real. And in our next show, I'm going to give you some instances of these children and the life they live. And the life they live. Right in here Clarksville. in Clarksville. In our city. Yeah, not a what. And in the communities and all around this, it. You, God blessed you. You started. Few, what year did you start? 2004. 2004. And you've been, it's changed your life. Completely. It's changed you. It's not just changed my life, it's changed the lives of so many volunteers and children and teachers and counselors. Our community, it's changed our community, and we'll talk about that in the next show, how it's changed our community. Well, you're special, gal. Thank you so much, uh, I mean, sir. Hey, you're special. Denise Skidmore, the founder and executive director of Fuel. This is her story. This is her background, where she came from, how she found the Lord and how the Lord led her to Clarksville to start this program, Fuel. What is Fuel? She'll tell us all about it next week. Tell your friends, neighbors, and loved ones to tune in. I want to thank Steve Sawyer behind the scenes for our guest, Denise Skidmore for yours truly, Greg Walker. Until next time, have a very nice rest of the day, folks.